Hello, and welcome to the very first episode of Crime by Design. My name is Jess Ferlippa, and thanks for tuning in. Crime by Design is a true crime podcast centered around the design, planning, and artistic elements in heists, homicide, and the history of the true crime world. I've always had a fascination with mysteries and an interest in true crime. I wanted to make my own true crime podcast on the topic, but I also wanted to bring a new and unique aspect to the table. Because of my passion and background in art, I decided to create a podcast dedicated entirely to that subject. My hope with this podcast is to teach people about the creative background of these cases in hopes they can enjoy the topic as well. For now, though, I think it's time to dive into today's case. The sources I used for this story come from YouTube.com, Co.com, Medscape.com, LinkedIn.com, ABCNews.go.com, and UnsolvedMysteries.com. All of my sources will be listed in the description for this episode. Today we will be discussing Lois Gibson, an artist, a survivor, and an amazing woman who found her calling through tragedy. We will also be discussing mature content, such as sexual assault and violence. Listener discretion is advised. With that being said, let's get into the story. Born in 1950, Lois Gibson was born with a passion for art. And as a young child, she was always drawing and using whatever supplies she could get her hands on. She loved pencils and paints, and Lois says sometimes she would even steal other kids' crayons and draw until there were nothing but little nubs. As Lois grew up, she found that not only did she enjoy drawing people, but she loved being the subject of the art as well. Leaving her family behind, Lois moved to Los Angeles, California. She was quite gorgeous and began her modeling career when she was in her early adult life. She dated famous actors, she did photo shoots for Playboy, and she even ended up becoming a dancer on a TV show. Although her L.A. life seemed to be a fantastic dream, 21-year-old Lois Gibson's future was about to take a dark and devastating turn. One night in 1971, 21-year-old Lois heard a knock at the door. On the other side, she heard the voice of a man claiming to be a neighbor. He told her he wished to get acquainted with her since they lived in the same apartment complex. Lois opened the door and the man immediately grabbed her. Lois described the attack as him suddenly ripping her neck to the side as if trying to snap it. He then beat her to the brink of death. At that point, the man began to rape Lois. For the entire duration of the attack, Lois thought she was going to die. Her life was flashing before her eyes and she thought of all the things she hadn't done yet, but wanted to do more than anything. She thought of how she never went to college. She thought of how she never got to have or raise children. And in that moment, Lois thought she never would. Thinking this was the last moment of her life, Lois was filled with hopelessness. She could do nothing to stop the attack. After an agonizing 25 minutes, Lois's attacker made his exit, leaving Lois for dead. When he was gone, Lois was finally able to assess the situation. Blood was coming out of her eyes and down her throat. Lois, scared and hurt, didn't know what to do. Lois was worried about reporting the attack to police. Some of her worries stemmed from reliving the pain she just faced, and others were from the police being a male-dominated occupation. She wasn't sure about how a man would accept her report of being attacked and raped, especially since she was both an actress and a model. Because of these fears, Lois never went to the police. This brutal attack, which lasted almost 25 minutes, would leave a lasting impact on Lois's future. The attack left Lois in a depressed state. She was alone in L.A., her family lived far away, and she started slipping into suicidal ideations. Lois said that during this time, she tried to kill herself, but it didn't come naturally. She said, quote, You gotta be spunky to kill yourself, and I never thought about it. I'm the most cheerful person, and I'm like, how do you kill yourself? And I couldn't. Then, six weeks after the attack, something unexpected happened. Lois was driving through L.A. She said she had a calling to drive up a road she was unfamiliar with. She lamented she didn't want to get lost in the streets of L.A. because of going down a road she was unfamiliar with, but nevertheless, she continued driving. Lois said, quote, Something took the steering wheel. I was trying to get out of traffic in L.A., and I went up a hill I didn't mean to go up. It was then she saw something that made her heart stop. On the balcony of a passing building, Lois saw him, her attacker. He was walking with two other men, and Lois was immediately angry, screaming to herself, how could anybody want to be friends with this man? It was then that she made another realization. 
the man was in handcuffs and being led to a police car by an officer. The man struggled with police, which in turn made them get physical with him for their own safety. Lois followed the police in her car, excited to see what was happening to her attacker. She was actually so suspicious the police pulled her over to check and see if she was involved with the man and his crimes. Lois was quickly dismissed as a threat, however, but her curiosity was still begging to be quenched. Turning to one of the officers, she asked what the man had done. The officer informed her that he was being arrested on cocaine drug charges. Lois was elated. Although he hadn't been arrested for her rape, he was still being arrested. He was being taken away and could no longer hurt her. Right before her very eyes, Lois saw justice in action. Though she never reported the man, she was still able to see him taken away as a criminal. That moment cemented in Lois's mind that the bad guys don't always get away with hurting their victims. Sometimes the bad guys are brought to justice through unexpected ways. Lois said, quote, I saw justice in spite of myself, in spite of not trying to seek it out, and I could go on living. What Lois felt in that moment helped her find new hope in life. She thought back to those heartbreaking 25 minutes. She thought about her life flashing before her eyes. She thought about her college dreams and how she hadn't had kids like she always wanted. And after seeing her justice, after six weeks of wanting to die, Lois began planning out her new future. Lois moved from L.A., California to Austin, Texas, and went on to get a fine arts degree at the University of Texas at Austin. She graduated with honors in 1976, and in 1977, she got a job as a dental lab technician with the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. She was studying to be a mastillofacial prosthesis technician. According to Medscape.com, a mastillofacial prosthetics is a branch of dentistry that deals with congenital and acquired defects of the head and the neck. Maxillofacial prosthetics integrates parts of multiple disciplines, including head and neck oncology, congenital malformation, plastic surgery, speech, and other related disciplines. During her time in San Antonio, Lois was still passionate with her artwork. She loved to draw and would sit on the San Antonio Riverwalk, drawing thousands of portraits of visitors and locals. She described the experience as entertaining because she was able to draw such an array of people, only briefly sitting down and talking with them while sketching out their portraits. The drawing session would last about an hour and would be a monochromatic piece. Lois was quite good at these portraits and was confident in her drawing abilities. Her next move to Houston, Texas, would be one that would put her skills to the test like never before. When Lois moved to Houston in 1980, she often found herself yelling at the news. A report would come on the TV stating police were looking for a suspect with brown hair and brown eyes and 5 foot 10. She would yell, that's half the population of the state. Her frustrations only grew with each report. She began questioning why police never had a photo to go along with the suspect's description. It frustrated her to no end, and soon she would snap. In 1981, a news report came on the TV about a dance instructor who had been raped in front of her young dance students. As usual, the news report gave out a vague description of the perpetrator. There were 701 murders that year, and Lois was exasperated at the Houston Police Department's vague description of the suspect. Lois was fuming. She yelled for the TV to be shut off. But Lois stopped herself. It was at that moment, Lois said she had an epiphany. Maybe she could help. She was confident in her skills, and she knew she could accurately draw someone's portrait. But as soon as Lois had the idea, the doubts quickly followed. She wasn't confident she could draw from a witness's description. How do you draw a man you've never seen? Is it even possible? And where do you begin? If she was going to help the police, she needed to prove it, not just to law enforcement, but to herself. Lois asked a friend of hers to go down to the local gas station while she watched her kid. However, the mission wasn't to get gas. Her friend's mission was to look at the gas station attendant, come back, and describe him to Lois. She would then attempt to draw the man her friend described. And so her friend did just that. She went down to the gas station, kindly greeted and spoke with the gas attendant, and then headed back to Lois. Once her friend got back, the two got down to business. Lois's friend did her best to describe the man while Lois fervently scribbled the best she could. As she drew, she got discouraged. Lois was no longer confident she could do the sketch. Her friend, however, told her to keep working. She told her she had to finish the drawing. Frustrated in herself, but encouraged by her friend, Lois kept drawing. 
Finally, the friend stopped Lois. She told Lois that the drawing looked just like the man. Lois was upset and told her friend not to lie to her just to make her feel better. Her friend insisted that the sketch looked like the man, and with Lois doubting the entire time, the two women headed back to the gas station. Arriving at the gas station, sketch in hand, Lois stopped in disbelief. There stood a gas attendant who matched her sketch. She dropped the portrait and began laughing and crying. The gas attendant picked up the drawing and looked at Lois's friend, commenting that she had done a good job of drawing him. Lois's friend stopped the man's praises and responded that it was not, in fact, her who had created the drawing, but instead Lois. She explained that she had simply described the man to her. The man, confused but impressed, praised Lois on her skills. The two women left without any more of an explanation to dry Lois's tears and set out to do what Lois wanted to do in the first place, help catch bad guys through her art. Now, armed with confidence, Lois approached the Houston police to offer her services. This, however, would be the start of an all-new battle. In 1982, Lois approached the Houston Police Department on a mission to use her artistic talents to help sketch suspects. They allowed her to help, but only on occasion. When she was given the opportunity to work with the victim, her sketches had a huge impact on the cases. Over 30% of her witness sketches led to an arrest of the culprit. When the department called her in, Lois would show up easel in hand. She would sit down with the witness and ask questions about the suspect's description while beginning to sketch with charcoals or pastels. Lois says she likes to start a sketch from the top of the face and work downward instead of working on the whole face at once. She says that this helps prevent smudging while she works since charcoal can get a bit messy. Because of this, the suspect's hair is typically drawn first and the suspect's shirt is usually drawn last. Afterwards, the witness can go through and ask for changes until the sketch is as accurate as the witness remembers. Lois Gibson had no formal training in the realm of police work. At this time, the FBI did have a forensic artist class, but it was only available for those in law enforcement. Lois was an artist, but not an officer or an FBI agent. Despite this, Lois had to take a chance. She went to the head of the FBI academy to fight her way into the class. She pointed out that Houston had 300 to 400 murders a year. Houston needed as much help as it could get, and because of her skills and determination, she was allowed into the academy to take the class. It was during her time at the FBI Academy that Lois learned of an amazing tool she would go on to use for the entirety of her career. The FBI has a feature catalog that has hundreds of different types of eyes, lips, noses, ears, hairstyles, and face shapes. They give this book to witnesses who pick out the features of the culprits they saw. One by one, a feature is given to a sketch artist who then composites everything into one complete sketch of the individual. The witness can then look at the sketch of the individual and point out any changes that need to be made to the drawing. At the time Lois was in the FBI Academy, this catalog was only available to individuals working in the field with the FBI. Since then, a feature catalog known as the Samantha Steinberg Catalog is widely available for purchase for the average consumer. Armed with this new asset, Lois was able to assist witnesses even further. Aside from her artistic skills, along with the new catalog, Lois also offered a very special connection to the victims. She, too, was a victim. She, like many of her witnesses, had faced an unspeakable harm that left a lasting impact. In an interview back in June of 2019, Lois was asked how it felt to work a job like this and how horrible it must be to relive her trauma every time she talks to a victim. Her response to the question was, I love it. It's therapy. Every time I get one of these guys, that's the whole purpose. That's the whole reason I put up with it. It's the hardest job on the planet, but it's the most fulfilling. For seven years, Lois fought to be taken as a serious asset to the Houston Police Department. Although she was able to convince the police to use her in some cases, they wouldn't offer her a full-time position. She faced sexism, discrimination, and bureaucratic excuses to work on cases. At this time, women assisting in law enforcement was uncommon, and Lois admits that artists are typically more emotion-driven than logic-driven. There were also some excuses such as lack of overtime funds or drawings not being reliable ways to find culprits. Lois said, quote, they did stuff that was bureaucratic to keep me from doing cases, but I kept succeeding. And that was true. Lois's sketches were leading to a positive identity one third of the time she was used. Law enforcement was still hesitant, however, calling Lois in for help. Lois said, quote, 
law enforcement thinks they're going to get a faulty sketch and they're too perfectionist. They don't believe that, wow, what if a faulty sketch could somehow maybe just get the eyes and the forehead and hairline? But what if a faulty sketch can nevertheless help solve the case? Law enforcement, you got to get out of your comfort zone. Call in the artist, get them alone with the witness, stay out of the room and see what you can get. Despite the pushback, Lois had an unfettered drive to help victims, survivors, and witnesses seek justice. Lois said, quote, the only reason I put up with it was because that guy killed me for 25 minutes. I didn't die, but I know what that feels like. After over seven years of fighting to convince the Houston Police Department to bring her on as a full-time forensic artist, it finally happened. Lois was offered a full-time position as an official forensic artist with the Houston Police Department. This was huge. Lois was now spending all of her time in the forensic art field. She not only assisted in sketches, but also in facial reconstruction and hypothesizing what victims looked like despite the police only having bones. She was able to use her artistic abilities, dental work background, and knowledge of human anatomy to piece together the victim's faces. Police would run faces through databases or release them to the public for help with the identification process. One time, a newborn baby was stolen right from the hospital when the baby was left unattended. In complete shock, hospital staff and police officers were in distress. All anyone had to go off of was the mother's testimony who had seen the woman who had taken her baby. Completely frantic, the mother sat down with Lois to provide a sketch. Lois calmed her down and began asking her to describe the woman. After less than an hour of talking with the mother, Lois had completed her sketch. It was released to the public, and almost immediately, police received a tip. The woman who had called in told the police that she recognized the wanted suspect as her girlfriend. Police were immediately dispatched to the suspect's residence. That very same night, the kidnapper had been arrested and the baby was returned to its mother. When comparing the mugshot of the kidnapper and Lois's sketch, the two were nearly identical. Lois said, quote, If that's the only case I solve, that would make my whole life worthwhile, seriously. Lois says that 100% of the time, the witness says either he or she didn't get a good look at the bad guy or can't remember them. 100% of the time. If this is true, how is Lois ever able to draw an accurate portrait? The visual cortex is in the back of the brain, and that is what caught the image of the culprit. It is a challenge, however, to get a traumatized witness to bring that image of the person who hurt him or her to the front of their mind. What kind of person would do this? What kind of expression did he or she have? These are the questions that Lois asks her witnesses. If the witness can answer these questions, the witness saw the suspect's face. Granted, sometimes the drawing may not be accurate. Maybe the mouth is too wide or the eyes are too narrow. Lois would argue, however, that a drawing is better than nothing. Lois once told the story of a young girl who had been sexually assaulted while at school. She couldn't talk and was quadriplegic. A man would bring this innocent young girl into a room alone, knowing there was no way for her to fight back and assault her. Communication with the girl was a challenge. She couldn't even use her fingers to click or point. Lois worked with the young girl by having her use her eyes to pick out the man's features by blinking for yes or no. Officers released the sketch, and school personnel said he looked like someone they knew. Realizing he was a man who would deliver supplies to the school, he was arrested. Although the face shape and hair was a bit off in the drawing, the culprit was caught and justice was found. Lois Gibson released a book with the help of author Diane Mills titled The Faces of Evil. In the book, Lois outlines her experiences as a sketch artist, as well as advice for future forensic artists in the field. Lois was also inducted into the Guinness Book of World Records in 2017 for being the forensic artist with the most sketches that led to criminal convictions. In present day, Lois is retired, having finished her 39-year career as a sketch artist in September of 2021. She drew a total of 5,089 sketches of both suspects and victims, and 1,266 of those sketches led to positive identifications. Occasionally, she still teaches classes on the topic, but she mainly spends time painting and being with her family and grandchildren. Lois says she wishes to inspire a whole new generation of artists to look into the forensic art field as a career path. There are very few sketch artists employed around the world to assist law enforcement, and Lois continues to advocate for them to be taken seriously in the field. Because of her, many have been brought to justice, 
found justice and will continue help seek justice. And that is the story of the world's most famous sketch artist, Lois Gibson. Overall, I think Lois's impact in the law enforcement field is undeniable. What would have happened if Lois hadn't seen her own justice when she was 21? Would she still be here today? What if she didn't go on to use her artistic abilities in the forensic field? She's talented, no doubt, but would her work have been able to help people in such a deeply personal way? How many people would have never been caught thanks to Lois's drawings? Would anyone other than Lois have been able to get close to helping witnesses open up about their traumatic experiences? Lois has many talents, and not all of them are artistic. Her ability to reach out and connect with others is a special gift. As the old Swedish proverb goes, and many of us artists are well-versed in, the best place to find a helping hand is at the end of your arm. Thanks for tuning in to Crime by Design. I'm your host, Jess Ferlippa, and I wish you a blessed day. Catch you next time.